fall asleep during this, which might be real easy to do. Well, I'm Marty Buffalini back again. This time I'm joined by Bob Casey. And even as we speak, uh, the quadricycle should be driving up. Here it is, driven by David Liepeld. This is a replica quadricycle built by George DeAngelis in, uh, was this for the 1965-63, for Henry's, Henry's uh, 100th birthday. The kitchen sink engine only ran for about 30 seconds. Gave Henry the, the encouragement that he needed that he could build an internal combustion engine. He built the car through the winter of 1896. It ran for the first time about midnight, June 4th, 1896, through the streets of Detroit. He had his friend Oliver Bartell ride on a bicycle ahead of him, making sure that people were out of the way so that this strange thing could come through. It really needed too many improvements. It wasn't worth doing that to this car. You'd virtually have to rebuild the whole car. So he sold it for $200. Well, that was pretty good. Now the car went through two different owners before it ended up coming back to Henry. Henry used the money he got as seed money to build his second car, which he had running in 1898. And I might add that uh, no one has ever gotten this quadricycle to run quite as well as David had over, over the past few years. It runs really, really nicely now. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Now, as David mentioned, Ford builds a second car in 1898. Uh, in 1899, he quit his job at the uh, Edison Illuminating Company and decided to, to try and go into uh, business full time. He builds a couple of race, race cars, uh, wins some races, gains publicity. Uh, and uh, with the publicity, he gained financial backers. And in 1903, June 16th, 1903, the Ford Motor Company was founded. Now, what we have here, first of all, is uh, Rick Lindner's, right? Is that Rick's? Yes. 1903 Model A Tonneau, driven by John Forster. This is Dennis Huron's 1903 Model A Tonneau, driven by Dennis Huron. And there is Rick Lindner driving his own Model A, because you can't drive two cars at once in his 1903 Model A Tonneau. Uh, the, the last car there, the Rick's car, is, uh, has, still has some original paint on it. The, the upper front seat and the upper rear seat, uh, that's all still original paint on there, isn't it, Rick? Original upholstery, too. In fact, I do believe Rick bought this car new. <laughs> Actually, Rick did not buy the car new, but Dennis's car here, the middle car, has been in the family since brand new. And Dennis did buy it new. Your great, your maternal, maternal? Maternal great-great-grandfather bought this car brand new in 1903. And it's been in the family ever since. Right? Right. Daily use ever since, right? <laughs> Let's see, I'll tell you a little bit about the cars. These are two cylinder cars, eight horsepowers. Horsepowers? $850 brand spanking new. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Really nice. It's amazing that that car has been in the, in the family that long. Now, in 1904, the company was doing so well that they outgrew the Mack plant and started construction on the Paquette Avenue plant, which was designed specifically to make cars. From the start, Ford wanted to build cars for the masses. At the time, cars were very expensive and rich man's toys. He wanted an inexpensive, reliable car that anyone could afford. Uh, and uh, so he came out really with um, an alphabet suit of soup of cars that uh, were evolutionary towards the Model T. Now, let's tell you what we have here in front of us. This very first car in front of us is a 1904 Model B Ford owned by the Henry Ford Museum. There are only six of these cars left in the world. This is the only operating Model B. I own the other five. And Malcolm uh, and uh, Dan worked hard to get this car running. They're sitting in the car there now. Uh, yeah, I believe it is. That's a 1906 Model F Ford owned by Wayne Kaufman that's moving up. Behind that is, is that Trent Bogus's? Trent Bogus's Model N. Paul Schaefer's Model S, correct? Correct. Okay, I knew I'd get it right. 
Uh, we had representatives of, actually, Ford built a Model C, an F, a K, an N, an R, and an S um, before he hit upon the Model T. And each of those, with the possible exception of the Model K, which uh, was a very large six-cylinder automobile that Henry built bowing to the pressure from his stockholders uh, who wanted a large, expensive, high-profit margin automobile. Uh, these were really evolutionary towards the, the the Model T, which is what Ford really, really wanted to build. The Model T was introduced in October 1908. Ford dropped all other models to concentrate on the production of the T. It's not an overstatement to say that, that this one little car, and I really can't emphasize this enough because I don't think people realize it, this one little car changed the world and it really impacts us today. Most people don't realize that. The, the sheer volumes of teas produced and thanks to mass production and the economy of volume production which led to ever lower tea prices, it forced other automakers to re rethink their marketing strategies and offer more affordable cars. Now, as more and more people around the world could afford cars because of the T and the mass production techniques, the demand for better roads increased globally. The increase in automobile manufacturing created hundreds of new industries, thousands of jobs, and increased wages globally. So in December 1927, Henry introduced the Model A. He started all over again with the alphabet. This new car is so, is so different that, uh, that uh, it's estimated that the, the, the publicity machine was working overtime almost for Ford Motor Company and interest in this new car was reaching a fever pitch. It's estimated that in the first two days of its introduction, 10 million people crowded dealerships just to see this Model A. Not this one, but the Model A Ford. More than 25 million saw the new car within that first week. At some dealerships, the mobs were so big and so unruly, the local fire department had to, uh, and the police department had to control the mobs. Thousands of cash deposits for the cars were taken in the first few days, although buyers were told it would be weeks before delivery. In less than two weeks, Ford Motor Company took orders for 400,000 Model A Fords. Uh, the A was produced uh, at the Rouge plant. And uh, by the time uh, production ended for the Model A, which was 1931, about four million of those were made. And this one is owned by Gerald Claus. Gerald, I forgot what city you live in. In Sterling Heights, Michigan, it is a 1928 Model A Ford two-door sedan. Uh, all Model A's had black fenders and undercarriages, but the Model A's came in a, in a variety of really very, very attractive colors. I don't know what the color this one is. Niagara Blue. Uh, and it was a brand new automobile from bumper to bumper. Thank you, Gerald. And that brings us to 1928. And Bob Casey's turn. Henry Ford did not like six-cylinder engines. Uh, he believed that uh, cylinders should be in multiples of four he believed they ran smoother, so essentially he said to Chevrolet, I'll see you six and raise you two. And he said, we're going to come out with a V8 engine. Ford did not build the first V8. Uh, other companies had built them before, but they were expensive and they were heavy, which was two things you didn't want in a car the size of a Ford. Ford Motor Company's great accomplishment was casting the block of a V8 engine in one piece. That's become so common today that we forget what an accomplishment it was. It was a really remarkable feat of, of, of foundry work to be able to cast that block in one piece, but that made the engine lighter and it made it cheaper enough, cheap enough to manufacture that you could put it in a Ford. And this is the car they put it in. This is a 1932 uh, Ford Tudor. It's owned by Mike and Mary Johnston from Ox Oxford, Michigan. Um, it's a little larger car than the Model A. A uh, little more stylish. You see uh, the, the fenders, uh, there's a little more flow to them. Um, and uh, with that V8 engine, it was uh, quite a fast car uh, for its day. Um, and, and especially for its price class. Um, the Ford V8s uh, began to win races. 
Um, and they also uh, became favorite cars among people who were uh, somewhat less than uh, legitimate in their activities. I think Marty mentioned in, in his history, mentioned earlier, that in 1921, Ford Motor Company had bought Lincoln Motor Company. And it gave Ford cars at the very upper end of the market, the expensive cars, the Lincolns, and at the bottom end of the market, which was the Fords. They didn't have anything very much in between. And as the Depression hit in 1929 and began, its effects really began to spread across the economy in the 30s, one of the things that happened was that the market for really expensive cars began to dry up. And most of the, the long line of luxury car makers in the country at the time went out of business in the Depression. We're talking about Duesenberg and Cord and, and Franklin and Pierce and, and Pierce and uh, 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 not Pierce, uh, Pierce Arrow and uh, uh, Peerless. Um, and they all went out of business, and uh, Ford was looking, especially Edsel Ford, was looking for a way to keep Lincoln uh, alive, and he conceived the notion of building a car that was uh, still a Lincoln, but a, a less expensive Lincoln, that would compete with cars like Buicks and Chryslers. And this was the result. This is a 1936 Lincoln Zephyr. It's owned by Ron Schneider from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, and it's a, it's a beautiful car, uh, which is very typical. Edsel was very much concerned with styling. Um, he essentially took a design that had come from a, a, a Dutch designer named John Charta, who had designed a very streamlined rear engine car. And Edsel knew that rear engines were not going to be widely, readily accepted by American uh, car buyers. So he essentially took from the, from the windshield back, he took John Charta's design, from the windshield forward, they redesigned the car to have a front engine, and the styling was done by Bob Gregory, who was at that point the head of styling at Ford, and they came up with this really lovely, rakish, smooth, uh, streamlined car, powered by a V12 engine, and um, it sold for about $1,320, and it kept Lincoln alive uh, through the Depression. And uh, as a, it's one of the reasons that the only makers, the luxury car makers to the survive the Depression were Cadillac, which had General Motors behind it, Lincoln, and Packard. And of course, Packard died in the 1950s. So this was, this was a car that was really essential to keeping the, the Lincoln nameplate alive. 1325, um, the 1936 were just really sort of coming out of the depression so people have a little bit more money to spend although and that's 1325 may sound for the times like a lot of money that's a heck of a lot of car for the price for the time this yeah yeah you you got a lot of uh, a lot of car for your money when in this effort thank you thanks ron Ensel Ford was constantly concerned with looking for ways to expand the, the, the company's market. And even after the advent of the Zephyr, um, you still had a big hole between uh, the, the Lincoln Zephyr and the most expensive Ford. And, and that was a hole that other manufacturers were filling. Uh, there were Dodges and DeSotos in there from Chrysler Corporation. There were Pontiacs and Oldsmobiles in there from from General Motors, and Ford didn't have anything in that market. And he, Edsel Ford finally convinced his father to, to build a car for that solid middle-class market. And this was the result. It first appeared in 1939. This is a 1939 Mercury. That's the first time that nameplate appeared. Uh, owned by uh, Larry and Nancy Deck from Plymouth, Michigan. Um, the, the Mercury cost about uh, $1,018 which was uh, considerably less, 300 and some odd dollars less than the, than the Zephyr. Um, it was uh, very much a, uh, an enlarged Ford, uh, longer wheelbase, uh, heavier car, uh, larger engine, still the, the, the flathead V8 engine, uh, bore a very strong family resemblance to the other cars in the lineup. Uh, at this point, 
Ford had gotten their styling sort of synchronized across the line and from, from the largest Lincoln to the cheapest Ford, if you line them all up, there were differences in size and there were differences in, de in detail, but they all had a family resemblance. You could all tell that they were, were from Ford Motor Company. And they were very smooth and uh, elegant looking cars and that reflects the influence of Edsel. That was his, his design aesthetic and they were all designed basically by Bob Gregory, who was the chief designer at Ford. That's a like boats, too. You can see that in, in some of the design lines on this car, the almost prow-like front end. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. We've been talking a lot about uh, Edsel Ford, and in a few minutes we're going to see a car that was named after Edsel Ford. If, however, there's a car that should have been named after Edsel Ford, this is it. This is a 1941 Lincoln Continental, uh, owned by John Forster from Royal Oak. Edsel had built the, uh, or had, had urged the production of the Zephyr, and uh, Edsel loved to customize cars, and he took a Zephyr one year, a 39 Zephyr, and they customized it. They stretched the fenders and they lowered them and uh, took a, a beautiful car and made it really beautiful and rakish, even, even more beautiful. Took that custom car down to Florida to his winter home and his uh, wealthy friends all loved it and said, gee, where, how can we buy one of those? And that spurred Edsel to go back and they ended up putting that car into production first appeared in 1940. Um, they called it the Continental. They made it a Lincoln model and they called it the Continental um, in part uh, because of the overall styling. Uh, Edsel would make a trip to Europe every year to look at the latest design trends. Uh, one of the things that the, he liked was that spare tire uh, out behind the car, uh, a European styling touch uh, and in his, his discussions with Bob Gregory when they were designing the car originally, he says, we, I want this car to be strictly continental in appearance. Um, uh, forever after, that, continent, that spare tire uh, out behind the trunk there has been referred to as a continental kit. And this is the origin of the term. Um, it's, another, it's the same V12 engine we saw in the Zephyr. In fact, it's pretty much the same chassis as uh, there was uh, under the Zephyr. Um, this car, uh, very few styling changes between the 40 and the 41. One of the neat ones, you see the door handles there, they're just push buttons. Uh, the 40s had a, a regular door handle and they decided to clean it up and uh, just have that very smooth uh, push button door handle there, make the car look even smoother. John, you told me this yesterday, but I can't remember. It's, this is a beautiful green with an awful name. Poopy green, what was it? Beetle green. Beautiful color, though. Thanks, John. As we all know, in uh, December 7, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, and the United States found itself at war, and that uh, put an end to civilian automobile production. And all sorts of, of strange and wonderful and fearsome vehicles began to roll out of the former automobile assembly lines. This is um, not terribly fearsome, but it is strange and wonderful. Uh, this is a 1942, 40, 42, 1942. Do I hear 43 uh, going once? Amphibious Jeep. Um, underneath all of that body, there is actually a Jeep chassis. Um, and it's designed to uh, run equally well uh, on land and water. 
uh, or maybe if not equally well, at least equally reliably on land and water. <laughs> Um, when you're uh, moving across a battlefield, you can't always find bridges, or sometimes the bridges have been destroyed. And it's really useful to be able to uh, just plow ahead across uh, bodies of water and swamps and whatever. This is a vehicle that was designed to do that. You can see the muffler uh, up uh, so that it uh, is not easily submerged. Uh, The first Ford Motor Company vehicles, brand new vehicles after the war, were not cars. They were trucks. And it was an all new line of trucks for Ford. This is, this is representative of that line. It's a 1948 F1 pickup uh, owned by John Capps from Manchester, Michigan. Ford introduced a whole line of trucks from, uh, from the, the half ton trucks uh, in the pickup uh, through uh, the, the large over-the-road tractors, um, and they, they designated them, uh, there were eight lines, and they designated them F1 through F8. That's the first time that this F and a numeral uh, designation is applied to the Ford trucks. Uh, they still use it for their, their light trucks today. Uh, the pickups became eventually F100s and now F150s, but this is the origin of that nomenclature. And uh, Ford, Ford really did go all out. This, is a, this was a brand new from the frame up design. Uh, one of the things that they tried to do was put uh, a lot of emphasis on comfort for the driver. Some of you were here yesterday and saw some of those earlier trucks. Sometimes there wasn't even a body, there was just a seat there. Uh, and you had things like the, the gas tank literally forming the dashboard. Um, and the, the assumption was that truck drivers were tough people and they yes, didn't need much tank. comfort. Well. If you want to expand your sales, you got to get over that. Ford. And Ford did. They uh, put a lot of effort into the design of the cab of this, this truck, uh, isolating it from vibration, making it taller and wider, giving it bigger glass area. And they claimed that they had spent a million dollars, which doesn't sound like a lot for design in a car today, but was a lot in 1948. They claimed they'd spent a million dollars on the redesign of that cab, and they called it the million dollar cab. Uh, Ford still finished in second place to Chevrolet in trucks that year, but they served notice to Chevrolet that uh, they, were, they were really back in the game and they were going to be a formidable competitor and uh, later on they passed them and, and is the number one, trucks, uh, number one builder of trucks now in the country. Thank you. All sorts of new vehicles were coming out of Ford in the immediate post-war years. This represents the first of the new tractors. This is a 1949 8N tractor owned by Marvin Bauman from Monroe, Michigan. Ford had, of course, been building tractors uh, since the teens. And uh, in, the, in uh, the late 30s, Ford had become connected uh, with a gentleman uh, named Harry Ferguson who had developed uh, what he called the Ferguson system. It was a hydraulic system for operating those, uh, the implements, the plows and harrows and things like that. And not only did it allow you to raise the implement up and down, but it was, the hitch was designed in such a way to make the tractor safer. There was some controversy about uh, what color they should paint the tractor. Fords had traditionally been painted gray. And uh, some people said, some, who were working on this tractor said, well, you know, the tractors always rust. And International Harvester has been very smart. They paint their tractors red. And so when they rust, you don't really notice it. Um, and then somebody else supposedly said, well, you know, the problem with that is chickens are always roosting on tractors. And if you paint your tractor red, you end up with these ugly, unsightly white marks, the chicken droppings on the red hood. So the story is that they ultimately compromised on the Ford. They painted the engine, the chassis, and all red, which minimized the rust, and they painted the hood and the bodywork gray to minimize the chicken markings. And so we end up with the uh, 
red and gray. Can you imagine what color it would be if cows could fly? <laughs> Don't even want to go there. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. This is a 1949 club coupe owned by Vic and Helen Hollingshead from Farmington Hills. Um, this is the first all new car that Ford built after the war. Uh, the story goes they had actually designed uh, cars and, and um, uh, the new Ford was supposed to be bigger than this. And they, in the, at the last minute, they decided they didn't want to make it that big. They, they turned what was going to be the Ford into the new Mercury and they went back from scratch and they designed this all new Ford. It's very clean, very modern at the time. You can see the fenders blend very smoothly into the body. There's no separate fenders. Uh, even, even General Motors, which is, has long been considered the styling leader, didn't have a car that looked as clean and modern as this. Um, it, and, and even underneath, it was a modern car. They finally abandoned uh, Henry Ford's uh, transverse springs and his solid front axles that he loved. It, this car had a modern coil spring suspension. Um, there was a downside to the, this uh, last minute change and this rapid design of this car. The build quality was not what it should be. And these cars uh, leaked a lot. They leaked water, they leaked dust. And we've got uh, some documents in the archives which detail all the various fixes that were going on, the running changes as they were producing these cars and they were getting complaints back about this problem and that problem. And it, it, there's a whole page of different kinds of rubber seals and readjustments and things that they were making to try to tighten up all the tolerances and, uh, and tighten up all the leaks. But they were able to do that. Uh, they, they straightened out the, the build quality problems. Uh, the car was a big hit, uh, not only in its first year, but in, its, uh, in the succeeding years of its run. And this is one of the vehicles, and Ford has them periodically in its history. This is what they, you might call a turnaround vehicle. We saw the Model A earlier as the Model T uh, really went past its useful life and sales declined. The Model A turned things around for Ford. This car turned things around for Ford in 1949. Um, in 1986, uh, they, things would be tough again, and the Taurus was designed and was a turnaround car. So that's, that's one of the many reasons that this is one of the milestone cars for Ford Motor Company. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Vic. <laughs> that's the right horn. Well, we mentioned earlier uh, the Continental, uh, which uh, could easily have, have, could have rightfully been named the Edsel. This is the car that was named the Edsel. It's a 1959 Edsel Ranger owned by Valerie Leach from Wald, Wald Lake, Michigan. Uh, we talked earlier about Edsel Ford's uh, constant desire to try to fill in the blank spaces in Ford's product line. And the Edsel, ironically, is another vehicle that was designed to do that. Even with Ford, Mercury, and Lincoln, there were still some sort of holes in that product line. Uh, Ford didn't have a car that competed directly with Pontiac or directly with Buick. And the Edsel was actually supposed to do both. Uh, they, it was going to be built in a large uh, wheelbase version that was going to compete with, with the Buick and a smaller wheelbase version that was going to fit into the Pontiac slot. Ford spent years doing market research, designing this car, uh, coming up with a car that they were sure was going to fit the, these market niches that they had laid out. Um, and they were going to make it, a dis they wanted to make it a very distinctive car. So they spent a lot of time on the styling and they came up with the vertical theme. Most cars by that point had, the, if you looked at the front end, it was sort of horizontal. Ford went back to what, as we have seen from older cars here, was an older idea of a, of a, of a vertical theme. Um, and uh, if they also spent a lot of time trying to come up with a name for the car. 
and went through hundreds of names, finally narrowed it down to four, Ranger, Pacer, Corsair, and Citation. Nobody at Ford Motor Company could agree on, they, could, they couldn't get enough support for any one of those names. And the suggestion was finally made, what about Edsel? Name it after Henry Ford's son. And that went back and forth, and ultimately they decided to do that. It turns out that was not a good idea. Two of the big things they tried to do, make the styling distinctive, come up with a distinctive name, turned out not to be the best ideas. Um, as wonderful as a man Edsel, as Edsel was, the name Edsel is a kind of an odd name. It doesn't flow off the tongue. Uh, and probably worst of all, even though Ford had done all this market research and they'd planned it, by the time the car came out in 1958, the, company, the country was in a deep recession. And the market for mid-sized cars like this was just drying up. And the Edsel was expected to sell 200,000 cars the first year. They sold 63,000. Um, they, this, that was in 58. They changed the styling somewhat in 59 to make it, uh, to mod uh, sort of modulate it a little bit. This is a 59. It's not quite as, as, as extreme as the styling on the, on the 58 was. Uh, it still didn't help. Um, they changed the styling even more in 1960, but by then the game was up and they, they pulled a plug on it. The other knock on the Edsel was the build quality. And as often happens, as happened in the case of the 49 Ford, when a brand new car comes out, there is often glitches. And the Edsel probably had no more than any other new car, a uh, brand new car at the time, but it had, there were enough, enough quality glitches initially that it gave the car a bad reputation, and that coupled with the styling, the name, and the bad economy did the car in. In fact, um, Edsel's uh, turned out to be, uh, once they got the initial bugs out, turned out to be reliable cars. Uh, Edsel owners now uh, swear by them. Uh, they are a very loyal group, and um, we're delighted to have this one here. Thank you. Here's a car that came out at the right time with the right styling and the right name and turned out to be a runaway success. These are 1965 Mustangs. The white one is, um, a, uh, is actually Mustang serial number one. Um, and it's owned by uh, Henry Ford Museum and being driven by uh, Malcolm Collum, our conservator, and the man in the passenger seat there riding shotgun is George Gunlock who was a volunteer who uh, spent a lot of time helping us get that car running again. Uh, behind it is another 65 Mustang owned by Luciano and Sharon Bastianelli from Sterling Heights, Michigan. Um, the Mustang, to, to a certain degree, it traces its origins back to the original two-seater Ford Thunderbird. It's sort of that car in spirit. but. Its real ancestor is a little concept car that was built in 1962. A little two-seater rear-engine concept car that Ford called the Mustang. And they ran it around the country, ran it at racetracks, took it to colleges, it made a big stir. Uh, people were excited about it, they were excited about the name. And some people at Ford wanted to build a car like that. Lee Iacocca, who by that time was the head of the Ford division, realized that the market for a two-seater like that was going to be limited. And he said, no, if we're going to build a car like this, a sporty little car, we're going to, build, we're going to make it a four-seater. And ultimately, this is the result. Um, it appeared in April of 1964. The timing was impeccable. The economy was good. Baby boomers were just getting to the point where they could buy new cars. Um, their parents were often in a case where they could afford a second car, and the Mustang appealed to, to all of them. Um, Ford gave it an, an enormous option list. You could equip it with a six-cylinder engine and a three-speed manual transmission, and basically you had a, an economy car. Um, you could outfit it with uh, all sorts of interior options, and you could have a luxury car 
or you could put uh, the hot V8 engine and the four speed and the, the disc brakes and the heavy duty suspension and you could have a sports car. Um, which is one reason you can almost never see two Mustangs from this era that are, are exactly alike because you could customize them with the option list any way you want it. Um, and the car was an enormous hit. Uh, these two cars are two convertibles, but they're very different. Um, and uh, the one up front, the first one's got the little 260 V8 engine, the other one's got the larger 289. Um, one, these are, these are both 1965 models. Uh, Ford introduced the car in April of 64, and for marketing purposes, they thought it would be really cute to call them 1964 and a half, um, which certainly catches your eye when you're reading the ads. The very early Mustangs have some differences from the later cars in the model year, and the people in the Mustang community refer to those earlier cars as 64 and a halfs. But Ford Motor Company officially refers to all of that first year as 1965s. So that's why we're calling them 65s. Great, thank you. This is a 1967 Mercury Cougar, owned by George Gordon from Marysville, Michigan. The Mustang was so successful that every other car maker copied it. And within a couple of years, you had the Chevrolet Camaro, the Pontiac Firebird, the Plymouth Barracuda, the Dodge Challenger, the AMC Javelin, and you even had a copy within Ford Motor Company, you had the Mercury Cougar. Like full-sized Mercury's, the Cougar was designed to be a more luxurious and more upscale car than the Ford. And the Cougar was a more luxurious and more upscale car than the Mustang. And you can even see it in the styling. There's, there's a, a, a more elegant look to this than the Mustang, where the Mustang is a more sporty appearing car. The Cougar featured uh, hidden headlights, and it also featured uh, sequential uh, turn signals. Uh, when you turn the turn signal on, you get the fl lights flashing yeah. in sequence. Uh, there was also a, a, a series of the uh, Cougar called the XR7, which was actually marketed as kind of a poor man's Jaguar. Uh, and the Cougar was, was a very successful car. Uh, whose, the nameplate stayed in the Mercury lineup for a long time. Um, this, uh, this, is, this actually is a very 19, late, late 60s car with, uh, with the gold. What is the name of that color? Fawn? Fawn. Uh, the color is fawn, a, a light brown with kind of hints of gold in it. And it has one of the, one of the classic 60s styling touches, which is the vinyl top, uh, the black vinyl top, uh, making for a very uh, elegant yet a sporty looking car. Thank you very much. And while the history of Ford Motor Company thank, thankfully did not end in 1967, um, and that is going to be the end of our Ford Motor Company parade. Um, uh, as we all know, Ford Motor Company's gone on, is alive and well in, uh, in, uh, in its 100th year.